wanted to talk to this is al calling in from yes. wisconsin al what's going on yes well i have a problem okay i was going to talk about scientology okay okay however i happen to have a degree in physics okay and physics is the biggest thing in my life so okay. Your guys babbling away has really piqued my interest. <laughs> However, well, I suppose I should stick to the sub. Go ahead. Yes, go ahead and talk because if you called in with the call screener, we want to know what you you were talking with them about. So I know I understand you were a former Scientologist, or you had connections to Scientology. I was in Scientology for I don't know maybe ten years. Holy shit! Ten years. Wow. Yeah. You, I think you are the first uh, former Scientologist that's called into this show, I think. So welcome. Well, well, thank you. Um, I have no clue what I'm going to say. I'm kind of hoping you will ask some questions and weed me. Well, yeah. Let me uh, start from the beginning, I'll be, I'll I guess. How did, yeah, how did you get involved with Scientology? Uh, oh, long story. Uh, I was a Buddhist. <laughs> for a while and I bumped into this guy that had me borrow this book that kind of fascinated me and I went to his center and I took some classes and uh, that was it. Man, okay. So you were in the org so so um, this was in Wisconsin or was this somewhere else? It was in uh, Minnesota. Oh, in uh, Minnesota. Uh, um, okay. So yeah, my yeah. understanding, you know, I'm not an expert on Scientology but I, I know how some of the beginning stuff works and you tell me if this is accurate yeah. i understand that they get you to come in and they want you to kind of take these classes you know i think first they kind of give out these like personality tests and stuff like that you know they want to figure out what that's about and then they want to give you more information about it, so they offer to you to sign up for these classes and the more classes you take you know the more money you put into it and then uh you know they try to give you a membership and eventually you start doing stuff for them. I mean, am I talking about the right thing here? Is that kind of what happened with you? You're halfway there. The okay. first half was correct. The second half was an error. Okay. Now, to my experience, okay. Uh, I've never heard of a membership. That, that is new to me. Okay. Uh, maybe I can clear a little, clarify a little bit of that. Um, most people don't know there's two parts to Scientology. There's one thing called Sea Org, and then there's another part called Public. Mm -hmm. I was public. Okay. And many people get into this. Uh, you have a question? Well, yeah. Well, I'm just trying to clarify for our audience. So Sea Org, if I recall, is where you get to sign the billion-year contract, you know, and, like, pledge your soul to the church, right, to, like, do stuff for L. Ron Hubbard. And then the public stuff is just working with – the public in general as a Scientologist, correct? Um, you're ninety percent correct. Okay. Uh, I wanted to br I wanted to bring up the C org. It's not a C, but it's S E A, as okay. in ship. Hubbard was nuts about getting on these three ships and traveling around the world, and he ended up calling it C org. But you're correct in that you uh, you sign up for this. I don't know what you call it. You, you sign up for millions of years, a contract that you're going to devote your life to this and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm going to be very frank here. I'm, that's kind of my personality type. Those people that do that, I think, are, shall I say, not very bright. Okay. <laughs> but you but you are in this organization. There's a lot of people that, that don't understand how somebody could even get involved with Scientology in the first place. You know, like for... For an outside observer, if you're just watching, you know, like South Park or something and you see it, you think like, oh, this is crazy. But obviously, I mean, there's people joining this like every day. So like, what was the appeal? And like, how did you like, what were you doing while you were there? Well, that you've already answered my question. Essentially, my first question that should have come up was, what do you believe Scientologists do? And your answer is you don't know. Well, I know they do. I mean, like, like I, I've seen going clear and stuff. You know, like I've I, I've seen a couple of stuff out there. I know there's different functions uh, of different members of the church, but I, you know, I don't know. I couldn't tell you all the different roles. So yeah, I don't know. Okay, the primary, no, from my experience, the primary issue is going into these sessions, in which the one person helps you remember past lives. 
Right. You know that. Yeah, I do know about that. Uh huh. The oh, uh, engrams and stuff. The, yeah. Well, most of the classes you take when you get into Scientology, they have real world applications. Like the first class you take is on communication, how to talk to people. Another class you would take, the second pro class probably, would be, uh, they call it super literate. And what that is, is learning how to use a dictionary. You get a book and you go look up every word in that book and then reread it and you find out that understanding what words mean are very powerful. I can't think of the third or fourth class, but those are the two big ones that, that you get into. So basically when you sign up for a class, and it costs like 50 bucks, I don't know what it is, it's a class on how to talk to people. The second one is how to use a dictionary. They're public, popular, or whatever. Then you find out about these other classes, and the other classes you take or the other sessions you take prepare for this experience to go past life. Then the majority of your work is going past life. That's the kind of the middle range. Then you get to the upper OT level, they call it, operating Satan, where you're... And that, that's restricted knowledge. You're not supposed to uh, explain what that is. Right. Next question. Well, so, okay, you were part of this org. Like, you were just taking classes for the most part? Were you doing anything else for uh, them? Uh, from my perspective, well, be, before I got in it, I said, I am not going to become part of a cult. I looked at it like they have a product. I'm going to pay my money for the product, get it, and forget it. That was my attitude. Yeah, and then, but you, I mean, you were with them for 10 years, right? So, I mean, what did yes. that look like? Uh, well, I did a bunch of classes in Minneapolis. I went out to California a couple times to get some of this upper level stuff. And then I moved out there for about a year, year and a half or two to get all the, uh, upper level stuff. So if now, you're comfortable, like? if you're comfortable saying, do you know how much you spent in total for all the times you've been there? Probably, probably 200 grand. Okay. Wow. Wow. Do you think that's pretty I typical? Be, um, the, the reason I left is because somebody got control of the organization and started increasing their prices dramatically, which was just untol not tolerable. So I left. Wait, so you didn't – wait, the only reason you left was because it got too expensive? It wasn't even because you disagreed with the beliefs? Yeah, it was just too expensive. So wait, do you no. still – consider like Scientology valid in some way? Uh, some of the primary principles, yes. Like what? Past lives. Past lives? Like, like, like we've yeah. been reincarnated from previous lives? Yes. Okay. Through this organization, through this organization, I have reviewed 500, if not a thousand or more past lives that I have experienced. How do you do that? And, well, now that's a good question. It's a very difficult question to answer unless you want to kill about two or three hours explaining what it I, is. I definitely it's, don't have enough time for that on this show, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but like, I understand. Is it like, is it from doing the the kind of um, hooking you up to one of those machines and doing it that way, or 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 how are you viewing past lives in this? I'll try and do this brief. Okay. The process includes closing your eyes and the person asks you some questions and you answer them. That's it. Now, you want to know how to go to past lives? Everybody can do it. I've trained, I went through the class to learn how to do it. I have sat with people that have no clue about Scientology and I have gotten them to go past lives. It's an extremely simple process. How do you falsify a belief like that? What if I tell you about uh, a past life, but I'm actually making up a story about myself? How do you tell the difference? If I'm, I have been presented with that question or concept several times, and I simply say, I know you don't, I don't care. I know you don't, I don't care? Uh, I've, yeah, got a, I've got a couple of questions, too, if I... If I might, on yeah, Matthew, go ahead. So, 
so the first thing that's coming to mind is the human brain, the human mind can be very, very creative. When you think of the dreams that we have, when you think of just how suggestive our thoughts can be, whether that's subconscious or conscious, immediately what comes to my mind, I try and think of, okay, what are some alternative uh, explanations that we do know are quite possible? And then how would we distinguish that? And so I'm thinking at the moment, this sounds like people's imagination because, again, that falsifiability bit, we, we need a way to show this. If you want people to believe it, if you want to tell people this is what's going on, we know it, we need some way to test it. It's the same with, with most science. So I'm thinking how would we distinguish this from human creativity, human imagination? I'm not claiming it I is. I'm it. just saying it's, it's a viable alternative. I have two answers to that question. Let me finish with both. Number one, I am not trying to convince you it's true. Well, this is truth wanted. This is That's kind of the whole point of the show. I'm not going to lie. That is like kind of what we do. Okay. Then I'll continue with number two. Okay. Uh, ask your phrase your question more accurately so I can focus on it. Uh, okay, how do you distinguish between these being memories of past lives and just being the human brain being creative and having an imagination? How do you know that these are real experiences that the person is remembering? Okay, the process that's used, you are taught the process before you begin the process. And it's very critical in the process that the operator says nothing that would suggest anything. The words are, remember that, remember this. The client comes up with their own things. You will ask him, okay, tell me something that hurt you. And the guy comes up with that by himself. Then the command might be, okay, locate a time something happened. There's no suggestion of the operator so everything that happens comes from the client's mind okay can i can uh, i clarify something uh, sorry to interrupt sure. i just i just want, oh, yeah. so so you mentioned that we're doing a lot to oh you're these uh, the people who are instigating this are doing a lot to mitigate suggestions but one of the problems with psychology and i will make this clear i'm not an expert in psychology i as we established i'm on the physics side of things, is that one of the big problems is just how easy it is to put ideas in people's minds. There's a problem where in psychology, the color of the room can give you different results for a test that had nothing to do with it. So even telling someone, think of something that's happened in a past, or just giving them the idea that you're looking for a past life might be enough. And so just because you've asked these questions, you've been careful with that, I, my alarm bells are still going up because there's still no way to distinguish between the person is still being creative and the you know, the past life. So if someone does come up with this, say here they have this story about a past life, I, I'm happy with the idea that maybe it's not just their imagination. Yeah, like that, here, that could be possible. Sorry, Dan. Well, like it's like look, I had a locker in middle school with a combination. That's something that happened to me in this life. If I can remember a previous life, surely I can remember my locker combination from middle school. And I could give you a number and we can test that number, right? Like we can see if that combination still works if we went back to that specific locker. So I'm wondering, uh, you know, tagging on to Matthew, what he's saying, what can we do with this past life stuff where we can demonstrate something the same way? Is there any way to do that? I do not think so. Now, I have heard people that have gone into operations uh, under, you know, they're knocked out. And later on, I have heard that people say they went through this session and they could recreate the entire memory of that event while they were unconscious. Now, I don't know if that's true or false. If they recreate it while they, they're unconscious? I know the human no. brain can actually remember things while it's unconscious. I think... Uh, particularly audio, so being able to hear things is very, very common when you're still in a coma. 
So the idea that they could, you know, that their body, their brain could still reconstruct something that had gone on is is not too far-fetched for, say, an operation. I, I have an, a, have an a... idea of potentially how to do this. Has this kind of past life uh, method ever allowed this person to discover something they couldn't have possibly known themselves? So they had a past life. <laughs> you go back through records, time. find that person, and could show something about that person that the other, uh, the initial subject didn't know. Yes. Uh, have you have you got an example? I'm just curious to to explore it a bit further. The information is spread all over YouTube. Okay. If well, you're willing, I, I'm. If that, you're that's willing. a re that's. It doesn't really help I, us on this live call-in show right now, Al. But tell you what, you know, we have other callers that we need to get to for right now. But this call is really, really, really interesting. Would you be willing to come back on the show next week at around the same time so we could talk about this more? I would be willing to do that. However, I'd more like to talk about physics. <laughs> okay. Well, like I said, we... Week. Next week, you know, we have we got some other callers that we got to get to right now. But uh, I don't know why you want to talk about physics when you were literally in Scientology, man. I mean, that seems like kind of a bigger deal to me. I don't know. Well, you don't know what I do physics in physics. Is cool. I guess I don't. I'm a quantum, I guess I don't. I'm really into quantum physics, but I'll talk to you next week. Okay, Al. Let's do it on a different time. We can talk about quantum stuff if we really want to. But, uh, you know, I don't know. Like, damn. That was our first call ever on Truth Wanted from somebody who has been involved with the Church of Scientology. And I'm very yeah. curious. That was pretty interesting. Now, like, I know the past life stuff is a thing that they talk about. And, you know, we chose to talk about it for this particular episode. But there's so much more <laughs> like it's Scientology. Like L. Ron Hubbard is probably one of the greatest grifters of all time. Like it's, it's undeniable that this man was just lying through his teeth through like so much of his career. I, I don't understand how anybody with, I don't know, anybody who could, who can Google in this day and age can, can get into, I mean, I understand why I understand why people get into Scientology, right? Because they're not like, there's there's a lot of pressure that goes into it, a lot of sales pressure that goes into those actual classes and stuff. I mean, like, I get it. I get the function of that. But at the same time, there's so many resources now to look into this stuff. And it's it's scary to think that people are still getting into it. And to be into that for 10 years, you put 200 grand, 200 grand into classes. And to say that that was worth it. I don't know. It's That's bizarre. It is sometimes it is surprising, but still well, sometimes surprising, sometimes not, but still shocking at least about how easy it is to influence people, how easy our brains are tricks are tricked. And that was one of the things that was hard, but you had to force yourself, at least in you know, through my studies, to come to is figuring out what is good evidence. What is sufficient evidence to say my conclusion is likely correct? I don't believe in absolute truths i don't believe you can be absolutely sure about anything but how do you get to that so when somebody says oh you can just tell or there's not really a way of demonstrating this that's immediate alarm bells for me but yeah. there was a time in my life particularly when i was younger where that whole idea of these past lives or psychics was very intriguing it's this kind of the idea of you could have superpowers we all kind of want that we want this ability to do things like that and we just can't underestimate our brain's desires to want those things to be true. Like, I, I wish I had the ability to read minds. Yeah. wish I could remember past lives if that was a thing. But sometimes the, the truth is sad. As much as we want to find that truth, we have to be willing to say it may not be what we want. And I think that's part of it. Not the only one. Uh, you've already pointed out some nice yeah. ideas, but... Look, if if there's anybody else that's involved with Scientology, you got to call into this show. That's all I'm saying. If there's more of you guys out there, let's have it. I I I, I can't even believe we just had that conversation right there. But uh, we need to move on.